Go to prayer. I want to not only pray for Florida, but uh, Lynn Lizzie, our administrative assistant, uh, her husband, Mike, lost his mom last night. She passed away. She was in her 90s. And Mary Lizzie's in glory. She's a believer. But uh, that tra traveling through the valley of the shadow is always difficult regardless. So I thought we would pray for the, the Lizzie family, but also pray for our, our loved ones, our friends and family members and brothers and sisters in Christ in the, the path of Hurricane Irma. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can come to you with our prayers. And we pray for, for Mike and, and Lynn as they say goodbye to his mom. We pray for comfort. We ask Jesus you would be there with them. They would sense your presence. Your rod and staff would comfort them. And Lord, we pray this morning for our friends and family, our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we know in Florida, in the path of Hurricane Irma. If you're here this morning and you know someone who's in Florida, in the path, feel free to mention them by name right now. Lord, we mention these names. Go ahead. Mm. Be bold, just say them out loud. Anyone else? Yes. Lord, I think of Ramon and Clara and their family in Tampa. Lord, I think of Mark and Audrey Smith. I think of our friends who have property down there, who wonder what's going to happen. We ask Jesus... You can deliver from the storm, but you can also deliver through the storm. We ask that they would sense your presence and power. Lord, as we turn to your word now, we ask for your spirit to be our teacher. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to believe, and a will to obey the gospel of Christ. We pray in his name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have you ever noticed that people now seem to be more easily offended? They're like, they have a short fuse. Can I get an Amen. They seem to have a short fuse, and I think of the universities, used to be bastions of free speech, now have safe places, places designated on campus where you can go, where you don't have to hear anything that's offensive. I thought that was the dorm room. I thought you could go to your dorm room and not have to listen to what other people have to say, but apparently they need safe spaces on campus because others are saying things that are offensive, and... Uh, isn't that a part of free speech? You're going to hear things that maybe bother you, stretch you. William F. Buckley, I used to love watching him debate. He's passed away, but quite a conservative thinker. He says this about liberals. Now, we have to be careful. Um, this is true of liberals and conservatives. We get kind of touchy when people say things we don't like. But his, his context, you know, he, you remember, have to remember, he's a conservative, and he's speaking about his experience with people on the other side of the argument. And he said this about liberals. Liberals claim to want to give a hearing to other views, but then are shocked and offended to discover that there are other views. Shocked that someone would think something different. We live in this culture where everyone seems to be on edge, ready to pounce. Last Wednesday night, something happened that I could have easily been offended at. I thought it was wonderful and cute. I'm standing in the entryway after our prayer meeting, and Isabella, who's 10 years old, 10 going on 30, <laughs> she's very intelligent. She likes to tease. She likes to joke around. And so I just have a wonderful relationship with Isabella. She's so open and just likes to, to talk to me, and we, we have fun together. She came up to me on Wednesday night, and she goes, Pastor, do you, do you exercise? <laughs> I was proud. I said, of course I do. I go to the gym three or four times a week. She goes, I can tell you have big muscles, especially in your stomach. <laughs> And she says, it, it's all muscle, right? And I said, honey, that's exactly what it is. Please tell my wife Lucy that it's all, it's all muscle. There's nothing I can do about it. I got such a kick out of it. And, and it just reminded me that, you know, 
something like that people can get easily offended at. Just the, the honesty and the transparency of a child. And just how I just got such a big kick out of it, I couldn't wait to share it on Sunday morning. So under this coat, just so you know, it's all muscle. <laughs> but one of the interesting things about the, the ministry of Jesus is, and this kind of stretches me because I don't view Jesus this way. People view Jesus, they're offended by Jesus. When you look at his experience in the Gospels, many were offended by him. When you look at our culture today, many are offended by Christ. How can Jesus offend anyone? Is, is my question, and but he, he offends just about everyone in some way, shape, form, or another. Each one of us here this morning at one point in our life have been offended by Christ. Maybe you're thinking, Pastor, that doesn't make sense to me. I've never been that way. Well, let's, let's jump into our text. If you have your Bible handy, turn with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, begin in verse 1. Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 1 is where we begin this morning. And I want to talk about the fact that Jesus offends, why he offends, and the fact that we as his people, his followers, can selectively attract and offend others in the gospel. Mark chapter 6, verse 1 is where we begin. And um, the text tells us that Jesus returned. It says in verse 1, Then he went out from there and came to his own country. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Sim Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And here's the key verse, or key phrase. So they were all offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, it tells us. He marveled because of their unbelief. And so you know, the question emerges, how can Jesus offend? Because they're offended at him. The text tells us, that Jesus offended them. Matter of fact, it tells us, it uses the word scandal, the, we get the word scandalized from. To be scandalized, to viscerally reject, to, hos, to have hostility, to reject the words of Christ, the works of Christ. They had this reaction that comes from their gut. They were offended at him and they rejected him. Now let's think about this for a second. Jesus offended the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Those were the religious leaders. He also offended the Herodians who were uh, politically connected to Rome, the zealots who were against Rome. He offended those two groups. He comes to his hometown, which uh, Nazareth is not much to look at, to be honest with you. It's not like the metropolis of Jerusalem or Rome. It's up in the country, bumpkins, if you will. He comes to his own town. And, and matter of fact, Nazareth is not much to think about. When I was in Israel once on a tour, our bus was heading north through the Galilee, and our, our uh, tour guide said, look off to the side. You can see the city of Nazareth. So we all look over, and you can see the cliff where they were going to throw Jesus off because they were angry at him when he was there earlier on Shabbat. You can see it, and he says, it's not much to see there. It's not much to look at. Even in our day, Remember when Jesus, decided, one of his disciples said, come, we found the Messiah. And his brother said to him, Nazareth, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Are you, really? Nazareth? So even the elites in the culture and even the common folk, I mean, those are at opposite ends of the spectrum, were offended by the person of Jesus because of something he said or something that he did. I would submit to you this morning, I like what Dr. Tim Keller says, Jesus confronts every culture, every group. There's some things we like about Jesus, and then there's some things that we're reticent to accept about Jesus. Every culture, every group. Republicans, if I can just get political for a second, there's things they like about Jesus and his teachings, personal responsibility, there's certain things they like. 
but there's certain things they don't like, like social responsibility. That's more on the democratic end of the spectrum, helping the poor. And so, you know, I don't care what group it is, Republican, Democrat, rich, poor, educated, non-educated. There's something about Jesus that confronts us in what we're doing. In Eastern cultures, they have a certain family connection, responsibility that they, they cling to. And some of the aspects that we like in the Western culture, love, acceptance, forgiveness, restoration, they struggle with. When it comes in the Western culture, such as sexual responsibility, many in our culture see that as regressive. They don't like that about Jesus, but in the, in the Eastern culture, they love that. And so he points out that no matter what group we come from, there's something about the ministry of Jesus, there's something about his will and his way that gets in our way, that frustrates us, that challenges us. Why is Jesus so offensive? He does offend. It says they were all offended at him. Why does Jesus offend? Let's look back at the text. Notice what it says. He was in the synagogue teaching, and they said, where does this man get these things? They were astonished. He was just a carpenter. He didn't go to seminary. He didn't go to Bible college. He was just a, a union worker, if you will. He was a manual laborer. How does he have these, this wisdom? How, do, how does his hands do these marvelous works? They knew what he was doing. They knew he had raised the, the, the daughter of Jairus. They knew he'd healed the woman with the issue of blood. They knew he cast out demons. How can this Jesus do these things? He's just a regular Joe like the rest of us. Verse 3, is this not the carpenter? Notice what it says. This phrase jumps out at me, the son of Mary. Maybe that doesn't jump out at you because of our cultural norms, but think back to this, this culture. How did someone describe their ancestors or where they come from? I'm David, the son of Jesse. I'm Isaac, the son of Abraham. I'm Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. You normally, in this culture, you connected with your father. So when they say Jesus is the son of Mary, what are they saying? I think they're saying that Jesus was born from illegitimate birth. That his mother was of questionable character, let's put it that way. It was a slam against the person of Christ. Their disrespect for him. I like what one author said about the person of Jesus. One commentator put, this, put it this way. Their discernment, that is, those who were around the person of Christ, those who were the Pharisees, the religious leaders, even the common people, their discernment could not penetrate, listen, their discernment could not penetrate the veil of ordinariness their discernment could not penetrate the veil of ordinariness that surrounded Jesus. Would you agree with me that Jesus was an ordinary man? Anil read from Isaiah 53, and then he, he quoted another text from Isaiah where the prophet says this, there's no beauty in him that we should desire him. I submit to you that Jesus was an ordinary looking guy. He came from an ordinary family. He lived in an ordinary community. He did an ordinary trade. He worked at an ordinary trade. He was ordinary. And so people, when they looked at him, said, he can't be the Messiah. The Messiah is somebody special. Can't be Jesus. They could, their discernment could not pierce the veil. But you know, when we read there in, in John's Gospel, John says, we beheld his glory. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They could pierce through the veil of his ordinary human existence. The direction of salvation, many people, they, they view this, you know, when it comes to salvation, there has to be something mag magnificent, something that we do to merit salvation. But it's all about the ordinary ministry of Christ and his extraordinary sacrifice at Calvary. 
all other religions see this, this kind of deliverance from some type of es esoteric experience that delivers me from, from this world. I'm on a different plane. But the gospel doesn't do that. There's an author. His name is Ramachandra. He's from Sri Lanka. And he's written a book that's published by InterVarsity Press. It's actually a little booklet. It's called The Scandal of Jesus. And he talks about Jesus and his ordinary life. And how that he came not to bring us to some new esoteric experience, some take us to a different plane, not to take us out of the world, but to transform our world. He's going to redeem the physical universe. We aren't translated from our bodies into some kind of spiritual body. Yes, we're going to be resurrected with Christ with a physical body. He says in Revelation chapter 21, Behold, I make all things new. He's redeeming not just spiritually, but he's going to redeem the physical, completely redeem the physical creation. Not to take us out of the creation, but to redeem the creation. Think of the story of Naaman the Syrian. Remember that story in the book of Kings? Second Kings actually, Naaman the Syrian. He had leprosy. The king of Israel said, come to uh, Elisha the prophet. He can heal you of your leprosy. And he comes, he comes to, uh, to, to be healed of the leprosy. And he comes to Elisha's door. Elisha doesn't even answer the door. He sends a servant out. and says, go dip in the Jordan River seven times. And Naaman was furious. I thought so he would ask me to do something grand, something magnificent to merit this healing of being healed of leprosy. Dip in the Jordan seven times. There's better rivers in Syria that I could go to. But his servant said, why are you struggling? Why not just dip and be clean? Something simple. The gospel, beloved, is simple. And it does challenge our culture. What does it take for a man to be saved? What does it take for a woman to be saved? Do we have to do some great act to merit salvation? No. We believe the gospel. If you believe in your heart that Jesus has been, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he's been raised from the dead, you will be saved. It's nothing beyond that. There's nothing we have to do. Now, obviously, when I trust Christ and I put my faith in Jesus and I become a follower of Christ, I want to live my life consistent with his character. He's going to change me. He's going to transform me. That happens. But it's not to merit acceptance. I'm already accepted in Christ. I have acceptance. I don't have to do anything to try to win his favor. His favor is already there for me. Notice what it says in the text. They couldn't look beyond his ordinary life. Isn't this Jesus the carpenter, the son of Mary, and his brothers? Notice the tec text mentions the brother, the half-brothers of Jesus. Mary had other children. Now, some would say, well, this is, these are cousins. In the original language, there's a word for cousin, but the word used here in the text of brothers and sisters is brother and sister. Aren't his brothers here with us? He's ordinary. Aren't his sisters here with us? He's ordinary. So they were offended. And Jesus said they prophet's not without honor in his own country. And then something interesting happens. He could do no mighty work there. Now this is explaining the consequence of their offense. This isn't the, the central idea of this text is they were offended at the person of Christ. The consequence was God was limited in what he was doing there because of their lack of faith. They limited the power of God. He laid his hands on a few sick people and he marveled at their unbelief. Now let's talk about how we can be selectively attractive and offensive in the gospel. It says they went out into a village, uh, uh, he, he went out about the village, villages in a circuit teaching. He called 12 to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and put, not to put on two tunics. So go under my authority, go under my provision. This is what I want you to do. And he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. Don't go from house to house looking for better accommodations. Be content with what's given to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart there, shake off the dust from your feet 
as a te testimony against them. You're, you're, there's there's going to be some that accept you, some that bring you in, and, and you can stay with them. There will be others who will reject you. The gospel, by its very nature, causes some to be drawn and some to be repelled. Shake off the dust as a testimony that we don't even want the dust from your, your village to be upon us because of your rejection of the gospel. But surely I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So they went out and preached that the people should repent. Don't we need that in our day? That the people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed many oil with oil who were sick and healed them. And so the, the gospel has this capacity, beloved. There's going to be some that are drawn to it. There will be some that are, are, are repelled from it. The gospel, by its very nature, is offensive. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I've been around some Christians, and they're pretty offensive. I've been around some people who claim to know Christ, and to be honest with you, I can't stand them. I admit that there are those kind of Christians out there that, that challenge others. But would you agree with me? I think many times it's more of an excuse for their personal rejection of the gospel than their real struggle with that individual. I think many times it's an opportunity for them to be, in their mind, freed from their personal responsibility to say yes to Jesus because so-and-so is a bunko, a jerk, right? It gives them an, a way out, a way to explain why they've rejected the gospel. But it's not a way out. Just because somebody's difficult to live with, someone's difficult to work with, someone's difficult on the job. I used to work with an individual who was a, a Christian. He spent most of his day sharing the gospel at work. So much so that the, the other, his co-workers got so angry at him, if that's Christianity, I don't want it because he makes me work harder. That's not the gospel. So it, it can be a form of an excuse because they, they want to be freed from responsibility. But we, we have to acknowledge, Jesus said, they've hated me, they're going to hate you. And it's not us they reject, it's Christ they reject. It's the gospel they reject. It's going to be selectively attractive to some. I remember my high school psychology teacher, his name Dr. Eugene Clarwell, and when he talked about Jesus, I was like, tell me more. I was drawn to it. And there are others that say, I don't want to hear another word. I... When I was in the Navy, I worked with a guy named Dave, and I was helping Dave move. And we were having a great conversation. I don't remember what, exactly what we were talking about, but I was trying to stir the conversation towards Christ. As soon as I mentioned the word Jesus, he went, whoa, stop. Just like that. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear any dogma, was his exact words. I'd, all I had to do was mention Jesus once. Whoa. I said, okay, Dave, we don't have to talk about it. So I made a decision. I'm going to reveal Christ through my, my deeds rather than my words. Remember Dr. Koshi? Love them until they ask you why. And so the, the gospel selectively attracts and, and selectively offends. But my question for you this morning, and I know time's getting away, have you been offended by Jesus? I'm willing to, to uh, I want to suggest to you this morning and ask you to, to think about it. Each one of us here this morning, at one time or another, have been offended by Jesus. Sometimes it's his will that offends us. Sometimes it's his, his way that offends us. His will, his word. His word has put specific requirements on us. He puts demands upon us. I submit to you this morning that when, when it comes to Jesus, he will ask of us more than we can ever think, but he will give to us more than we can ever dream. His call is a big call. I, I like what G.K. Chesterton said. It's not that the gospel has been tried and found wanting. It's the gospel has been found hard and left untried. Because there's a certain aspects about the gospel. Yes, it's free. Yes, I just believe. But now he says, follow me. And sometimes when he says, follow me, then I've got to take up my cross. I've got to be willing to follow. And in our culture, it's challenging to be an evangelical Christian, to be a Bible-believing Christian because in our culture, just a couple of things I want to mention. Uh, one is in the area of sexual ethics. God has certain boundaries when it comes to sexuality, how we express ourselves sexually, and these boundaries are in his word. And our culture does not like them. Whether it's cohabitation, many in the church are practicing cohabitation now. 
I live with my boyfriend and my girlfriend before we get married. And they have certain rationales and, you know, hey, you don't buy a pair of shoes before you try them on, right? You don't, drive, you don't buy a car before you take it for a test drive, right? I mean, they have certain rationales and, you know, those are, can be convincing. But the, actually, the statistics bear out, beloved, that those who practice cohabitation have a lower success rate in marriage than those who stick to traditional marriage. Our culture says it's fine. And it's not my intent here to judge anybody here this morning. This is what the scripture declares. Let a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife in a marriage. And then the two shall become one flesh. When it comes to same-sex attraction, our culture has a whole different ethic now than it had in the past. And those of us in the body of Christ who want to cling to the biblical ethic are called names now because we say, this is what Jesus says. The culture is going a whole different direction. And if you say, this is what Jesus says, they're offended at the suggestion. I didn't think I'd have to mention this in my lifetime. But now there are those who are arguing for polyamorous relationships. Polyamorous polygamy. The very arguments that were used to justify same-sex marriage are now the arguments that are being used to justify polygamy. Who were you to say? what two people or three people or four people want to be in a contractual arrangement of marriage. Why does your moral standard better than our moral standard? Our culture is rapidly changing. And to many, Jesus, the demands of Christ, the will, the word of Christ is offensive. How about when it comes to how we expend our resources? Now, the scriptures talk about the idea of the tithe. And believe me when I tell you, this isn't about filling the offering box. But God calls us as his people to be giving. It says, Jesus says in Acts chapter 20, Paul quoting Jesus who says, remember the words of the Lord Jesus, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, as a young man, I didn't believe that for a second. I always thought, no, it's better to get than to give. That doesn't make sense to me. But as I've gotten older in Christ, as I've had the opportunity to share my resources with others and to see the look on their face, to, to receive the joy of partnering with someone in ministry, it's liberating. It's true. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And we struggle sometimes because in the natural we think, wait a second, Pastor. You're telling me it's better to keep 90% of my, re my salary rather than to keep 100% of my salary? It doesn't make sense to, that 90% is better than 100%. But it's a, it's a biblical principle. God calls us to share of our resources, whether it's in the congregation, whether it's with others. How God wants us to share of what he gives to us, to let go, to have a light touch on his things. And I can honestly tell you this morning that I've never hear me, never met people who were tithers, who, were, who shared of their resources, who were in financial distress. I've never met them. God always takes care of them. God always provides, somehow. It may not be easy, but he always provides. He, he sees us through. It's a matter about priorities. Jesus said, what's the first great commandment? To love the Lord God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second, like it, namely, is this, that you'll love your neighbor as yourself. Then comes me. And so it's a matter of priorities. I put God first. I put others first. It's an opportunity for me to share of what he's given to me. Just those things, I could go on and on about how those things can offend us. And that's just his word and his will. But what about his way? What about his way? Circumstances. That's where, as a pastor, I've met most challenges when it comes to people who are offended by Jesus. What do you mean by circumstances? Something happening in their life that's difficult to deal with. I can't tell you how many people I've met. I said, hey, are you a, are you a Christian? I, by going to Columbia on mission trips, they're very blunt. They'll ask someone, are you a Christian? No either answer yes or no. And I you know before I would think, gosh, and here, in, especially in New York, where the, the ground is kind of hard, the people are kind of cold, reserved, let me put it that way, reserved. To ask that question is kind of bold. But, you know, you ask the question, are you a Christian? And, and, and I've had people respond this way. 
I tried Jesus, but some things happened in my life, and I thought, why would God let this happen to me? He must not exist. You see, circumstances come in our life, and because they experience a hard situation, a difficult circumstance, they're offended at God. Why would God let this happen to me? This doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. I've asked that question myself. I would say, God, I'm on your team. I've signed up. I don't get it. Why is this happening to me? Remember John the Baptist, when John the Baptist was arrested and thrown into prison? He sent two disciples to Jesus to ask him, are you the Christ or are we looking for somebody else? Because to be honest with you, I'm in prison right now. This doesn't seem right. I was expecting to be the prime minister in the new kingdom. And yet here I am doing time. He's in a prison. Are you the Christ or are we looking for somebody, other, somebody else? And Jesus says, go back and tell John this. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. The poor have the gospel proclaimed to them. And then he says something interesting. Blessed is he who's not offended in me, scandalized, because of a circumstance. John, I know you're in prison. I know it's hard to deal with. But please don't be offended because of your circumstances. Don't allow your circumstances to overwhelm you. Each and every one of us are going to go through a hard time. Don't allow your circumstances to overwhelm you. Some here this morning are going to get a layoff notice that says, you're done in two weeks. Lord, what am I going to do now? And the answer is, why God? We look up to the heavens and we declare, why God? Maybe it's a, it's a financial setback. Something like Hurricane Irma. Why is this happening? You, you skirted the Dominican Republic, but you're going, to, it's a direct hit on Florida. And why, God? Why is this happening? To, what did we do? Why are you angry at us? Maybe it's you get that, uh, that diagnosis you dread. That diagnosis. I had a conversation with someone who got a diagnosis of cancer recently. And we sat and cried together, and they asked me that question, why is God doing this to me? I don't have an easy answer. I know there is an answer. But many times, you know, like I said, he can deliver us from the storm, but he can deliver us through it as well. And my encouragement to this individual was, I'm convinced that when we, God is going to heal you, when we get to the other side, we're going to look back and we're going to be able to have with perspective, think, that's why God did that. But in the midst of the, of the trial, it's hard to gain perspective because you don't see the whole experience as it's laid out in front of you. There's so many unknowns. Or maybe it's that notification of a loss of a loved one, someone dear, a spouse, a child, a parent, a sibling, a close friend. And we look to the heavens and we cry out, why God, why is this happening? I don't understand it. I remember standing next to the to the, the body of an individual and their family was there and one of the kids was crying out, why did this happen? Over and over, why did this happen? Why did this happen? We looked at the heavens and we say, why God? There's no easy answers, is there? One of the things I've, I've thought about in relation to these kind of situations, when something good happens to us, I mean, I've been talking about things that are bad that happen to us. When something good happens to us, we ever look at them and go, why God? <laughs> We don't do that, do we? We never look at them, why God, I feel so blessed, this isn't fair. Or when something good happens to somebody else. Sometimes we'll go, why him and not me? I don't get it. Why Eric and not me? You know, why is this happening to me, not happening to me? And we can ask that question, but we never ask the question when bad things happen, why not me? Why not me? I've always envisioned, you know I like food, I always envision our lives many times are like the checkout lines in a grocery store. And sooner or later, we're going to be in the express lane because time is short. Sometimes we're in the lane, we know there's all these, there's someone, two big carts full of groceries, and you go, I'm going to be here forever. But sometimes we're in the express lane. Each and every one of us, I have bad news for us, each and every one of us this morning, there's going to be things in our life that are happening that are going to be bad. 
and I don't want us to turn away from Christ. Remember what happened with Peter and the disciples in John chapter 6? They were there with Jesus. Jesus was teaching hard things. And many of the disciples started to walk away. And Jesus looked at his disciples, his apostles, and said, will you too walk away? What was Peter's response? Where can we go? You only have the words of eternal life. Where can we go? When, beloved, when bad things happen to us, where can we go? We can't turn away from Jesus because if he is the Lord God Almighty, and he is, and when we turn away from Jesus, we turn away from everything. And so when bad things come in our lives, when difficult circumstances come in our lives, like Peter, Lord, where can we go? We're not going to turn away from Jesus. Beloved, I encourage you this morning, whatever struggle you're going through, turn towards Jesus. Embrace Christ. And be honest with him. Lord, this stinks. I don't understand it, but please help me. Walk with me through the valley of the shadow because I desperately need you right now. I was talking with somebody in chemo, and they said to me, Pastor, I never thought it would be this bad. I need Jesus to help me. And I looked him in the eye, and I said, Jesus, it will help you. Believe me when I tell you. He'll never leave you. The Bible says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Amen? He's going to see us through. One of the wonderful things about Christ is he's right there with us. But another wonderful thing about the body of Christ is he's put us together as a body of believers, as a church, as a family, to walk together through difficult times. To visit someone in a hospital and to see their face light up. Sometimes with me, they look at me and go, oh, it's you. <laughs> but sometimes it lights up. <laughs> They're excited to see me. But to be a body of believers, to walk together in the gospel. Beloved, don't turn away from Jesus. Don't let the circumstances offend you so that you turn away from Christ. Turn towards him. Embrace Christ because he's there for us. After our band of brothers yesterday, we went out to breakfast at the Lakeview Bowling Alley there in Liverpool and we came and sat down right at a table and we were just looking around. They had all these plaques of sayings of faith and one of them was the serenity prayer. Now back when I was a younger Christian, I used to make fun of the serenity prayer. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. I, I made fun of that prayer when I was a younger believer. As I've gotten older in Christ, I begin to realize the depth that's in that prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I can't change. Grant me the peace of Christ amidst that struggle I can't change the fact that I got to go through chemo. I can't change the fact that my loved one is gone. I can't change the fact that my job is over. But Lord, grant me the peace of Christ, the serenity and the circumstance to endure, to press forward, to embrace Christ in the situation. My team won yesterday and I was watching. <laughs> I was on edge for a while. But I was watching the post-game press conference on the internet on uh, the website for the school. And Coach Harbaugh was talking about what the players were experiencing with Hurricane Irma. And he said something I thought was very profound in a press conference, a sports press conference, matter of fact. They asked him about, you know, what his players were going through. He said, well, a lot of the players were talking about, but this is, we have no control over it. He said, the only thing we can do is pray. Now, that came out of the coach's mouth. The only thing we can do is pray. And beloved, there's going to be situations we have no control over. And all we can do is pray and say, Lord, grant me the peace of Christ. Grant me the serenity I need in this circumstance so that I can endure through Christ. He will see us through.